Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, it's my pleasure to animate this new webinar of the ENS school based section dedicated today to the retro sigmoid approach. We have a very nice uh, panel of speakers this evening with new ones. You will see very interesting talks. Uh, the first speaker will be Stefan Lieber. You already listened to the talk of Stefan on the anatomy of the endoscopic endonasal approach. Now he will discuss the anatomical aspects through the retrosigmoid approach. Normally, Sebastian Frulich will join us to discuss some technical aspects for the opening. Then uh, we'll speak Pierre Ugroche from Marseille about the closure techniques in order to avoid CSF leakage. We will have the chance to listen to Timothy Jackson on the interest of MR tractography. Then uh, we'll have the chance to listen to Michel Calamarides working in Paris at the Salpetriere Hospital in France about the vestibular schwannoma surgery with facial and auditory monitoring. And he will discuss the influence on the surgical procedure. Then we will listen to Marcos Tatagiba, as you know, from Tübingen, very experienced in the vestibular schwannoma surgery. And he will discuss with us the surgical technique, the treatment philosophy he develops, and the result of his surgery. And we'll have the chance to have also with us this evening, Massimiliano Bizocci from Roma in Italy to discuss with us the microvascular decompression and its new trends and the new technologies. So I give the floor first to Stefan Lieber. Please, Stefan, we are listening to you about the anatomical aspects. Please, Stefan. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Um, can you see this all right? Yes. Perfect, all right. So I'll be talking, I'll be covering some of the anatomy of the retrosigmoid approach. And being the first speaker of this uh, illustrious group, I just wanted to, rem to remind all of us that this, um, the first description of a unilateral suboccipital or retrosigmoid approach as we, as we know today um, is, um, is essentially 120 years old already. First description by Feder Krause in Berlin. Um, as we know from Cushing's description around, around the same time, this was still a bilateral decompression of the, of the posterior fossa or access to the posterior fossa. Um, and the next description, the series, the beautifully illustrated series of Walter Dendy slide data is the first unilateral um, description, which employs a lot of the techniques as we know today with openings of the cistern, um, capsula and dissection, drainage of CSF, from the cisterns or even from, uh, from access to the ventricle. I will be um, briefly covering just some of the bone. We are talking mainly uh, for this approach, we're talking about the, um, the asterion. We have the, the terion here, the parietal squamous and the parietal mastoid suture here. And this triangular suture, the asterion of the parietal mastoid and occipital um, occipital uh, mastoid and parieto, uh, parieto occipital um, fissure is um, fusion is here this, this bony landmark which we are using. We have the supramaxoid um, mastoid um, crest, um, the squamous part and the mastoid portion of the um, petrous bone. It's um, the asterion itself is not a reliable, a reliable landmark for, for, the, um, for the genu of the transverse and sigmoid sinuses. But this is a nice depiction of, um, of this, this uh, rough landmark. This is a left side, uh, just a posterior projection here. We have the, the, the mastoid tip. We have the parieto mastoid um, suture here, the parieto occipital suture, and the parieto, um, the occipital mastoid, you should say here, with the um, asterion and the verbal just slightly inframedial to it, which exposes on the inside of this, of this left side just the genu of the transverse and the trans uh, sigmoid sinus here. This is the, the lambda suture. This is the occipital crest towards the uh, occipital, um, to the, towards the foramen magnum. And um, the, retro, the, the correlate here for the um, emissary vein, which can be seen on the extern um, external view also with the uh, sigmoid sinus here. So again, occipital bone, parietal bone, and mastoid portion of the petrous bone or temporal bone. Um, this is obviously not a retro sigmoid approach, but it's the extension of the retro sigmoid approach. Um, we'll be covering some of the anatomy exposed in this, um, in this specimen here. In later talks, we'll be having uh, the extension, transcondylar extensions, uh, transpetrous uh, combined extensions, and of course the phylateral um, 
approach. This is just an illustration of the anatomy around um, around the uh, the genome of the sinus and the posterior fossa, which we'll be covering in this talk. This is a skull based talk, but um, some of the some of the brain anatomy just. Briefly, the emergence of the cranial nerves from, from the brainstem. We have five here in the vacuum pontus. The minor and the uh, major portion, we have um, the, um, the olive here with the anterolateral and posterolateral sulcus. And the uh, decussation here of the pyramid, we have six emerging from the contromedullary sulcus. Um, Twelve emerges anterior, so in the uh, pre olivary sulcus, or so the anterolateral sulcus and posterolateral sulcus is the nine, 10, and 11 and the lateral extension of the control um, medullary sulcus is the, uh, the origin of seven and eight here in this ventral view of this brainstem. This is now a retrosigmoid um, perspective or, or an extended retrosigmoid uh, ex, um, uh, perspective of, of a right side in a, in a specimen, which gives us um, the seven and eight complex, nine, 10, and 11, the cranial spinal rootlets of uh, 11 ascending towards the um, jugular foramen. And then in the more anterior 45 degree trajectory, you have the hypoglossal nerve here. Again, this is the olive. We have a posterolateral and anterolateral emergence uh, of the cranial nerves here. Some of the res uh, vesicles will be really uh, covered in a, in, a, in a later slide. This is again, not a strictly retrosigmoid perspective, but a, a more lateral perspective towards the anterior surface or the ventral surface um, of the brainstem. Again, you can see the olive. You can see a uh, choroid plexus, frocculus, um, brachium pontus with, with five, even four here in the, in the cisternal space um, and seven and eight. So essentially all the cranial nerves, uh, 12 down here towards the, uh, towards the vertebral artery. Um, we'll be covering probably some of the uh, uh, vestibular schwannoma surgeries and aspects of, um, of um, extended approach, um, infra uh, supra meatal drilling, infra meatal drilling, drilling of the jugular tubercle, probably also, um, and um, the discussion or potential discussion of uh, venous uh, sacrifice or venous injury to some of the draining veins, the most important one being uh, the vein of denia, superior petrosal vein, which, which drains anterior just superior or even inferior, so lateral to the um, inferior, uh, internal acoustic meatus into the superior petrosal sinus. And it's essentially the, the most important um, draining structure of the cerebellum and the anterolateral aspect of the, of the brainstem. This is um, highly variable. So this is the draining area of, of um, Dendy's vein. Um, and as we, um, as we know from, uh, from Matsushima's or Roton's classification, there's four draining groups. So the green estrangers can be organized in, in four, four groups. Um, the Dendy's vein itself is not necessarily just one draining vein. It can be a complex of, uh, of bundled veins. Um, there's a lot of variation, but generally this is a, a useful classification for, for the green estrangers of the brainstem. The most important one being the vein of the cerebellopontine fissure which drains the, the, the superior and ventral aspect, which is the main contributor to, to Denny's vein. Then we have uh, the anterior mesencephalic group, which is mostly the transverse pontine vein, which is this group of veins, which is sometimes in rare cases associated with um, the venous, the venous um, trigeminal neuralgia, venous um, compression syndromes. Then we have the pontotrigeminal vein, which is the, the ventral aspect um, causing here behind um, the superior contribution to, to the Vendy um, um, uh, complex, and then the tutorial um, um, contributions, the lateral compute, uh, contributions, which probably can be seen um, partially here in, in some other slides, but not in this isolated um, cerebellar and brainstem specimen. Just very briefly, but this is probably more, more familiar, that's um, covering the, um, the, the arterial supply of the posterior fossa. This is a superior view, um, obviously not, an, uh, not a surgical exposure, but a, um, an endotopical dissection with a very prominent um, basal and, and uh, vertebral artery here on the left side. This is the tip with the posterior cerebellar, uh, posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery with uh, three traveling between the perforators, Pachon perforators here in the interventricular fossa, which has been cut out. Then we have a prominent ICA on the left side, a very dominant uh, vertebral artery. And as we'll see in a later slide, uh, a slightly hypoplastic vertebral artery and, and um, pica complex 
on the on the right side. This is the same specimen, just right, slightly inferior. Again, a very prominent vertebral artery um, here, hypoplastic um, vertebral artery on the right side. This is the Pica complex, um, Ica complex with the main contributors to, um, to labyrinthine artery and subacute artery, the, the arteries we will be discussing in uh, relation to vestibular schwannoma surgery. Um, and then the parapetres of the, of the pons and the brainstem again, contain uh, perforators here in the interbidoncular fossa. This is returning to this, um, this right-sided retrosigmoid um, view into the, um, into, the, um, into the internal acoustic um, meatus and the jugular foramen. And there are some aspects uh, we already discussed with this, uh, some, some draining veins, uh, probably the, the dendy vein itself is slightly superior in the specimen and five nerves coursing into the internal canal. And there's this particular um, topography for this. There is a superior um, and inferior compartment, which is divided. Um, I will show this in this next slide. So essentially we are talking about five nerves, the, um, the cochlear nerve, the superior and inferior vestibular nerve, the small um, intermediate nerve, which is related mostly to the facial um, and the, um, uh, well, essentially the, yeah, the three bundles of the vestibular cochlear nerve, intermediate and facial nerve running super, um, super anteriorly. Then we have the nerves coursing into the jugular foramen, the glossopharyngeal nerve, um, tenth nerve, and again, the ascending spinal and cervical fibers of um, these, um, of the abducent, uh, the um, accessory nerve. This is the typical distribution of these five nerves coursing into the internal acoustic canal. This is again, a right side, anterior and superior exposure here of this posterior aspect of the petrous bone, builds bar and falciform crests are bony, bony, um, bony lamellae, which can be seen also in on high, high um, resolution CT, which essentially divide this, um, this, uh, the fundus into, into this aspect with a facial and intermediate nerve running um, anterior superiorly, cochlear nerve um, anterior inferiorly, and the both division of the vestibular nerve um, most, um, more um, posteriorly from the retrosigmoid um, perspective. This is best understood only briefly because we're talking about posterior fossa, not directly about petrous bone um, anatomy, but only um, briefly to better understand this, um, this distribution within the petrous bone and maybe also the, the bony protrusions um, that might be covered in a supramatal extension, inframatal drilling or uh, drilling of the jugular, jugular tubercle from the retrosigmoid um, perspective. And just we will be exposing the, the intrapetrous structures um, of this region here with the internal meatus canal in this um, open dissection, which is um, um, displaying here the, the stibular system with a semicircular canal or, or canals. Um, we have the cochlea, which is partially drilled, and we have the facial nerve, which runs um, anterior superiorly, with the uh, cisternal segment, labyrinthine, genu, and um, tegmen. Um, tympanic segment and here the descending stylomastoid segment. So this is essentially the cause of the, of the facial nerve in the previous bone, um, GSPN, um, giving off GSPN in the genicular portion here and posteriorly, we have the superior and inferior um, branches of the vestibular um, cochlear nerve. This is the intermediate, which runs um, with the facial nerve and inferior to this, we have the cochlear nerve, which connects with the uh, cochlea. Just briefly touching on jugular foramen anatomy. Jugular foramen is, is, a, is a partially bony and partially um, a, a dural um, compartment within, within this, um, this, this, bony, bony, um, this bony compartment formed by the petrous, uh, by the petrous um, bone and the occipital bone. Again, the, the tympanic and the mastoid portion of the, of the petrous bone. Um, there is an intrajugular process which can be uh, also defined for the, there's, a, there's various um, compartments, but there is a main venous um, compartment, the, the sigmoid part, which is essentially the jugular bulb, um, the, final, the final turn of the sigmoid sinus, and then the anterior um, nervous um, compartment with essentially 9, 10, and 11. We have the venous contribution of um, the inferior petrosal sinus, which runs in the um, petro occipital or petroclavial fissure. Um, and this gives 
is an, an interior, smaller interior um, venous compartment, the vein venous compartment posteriorly and a small nervous compartment uh, in the anterior aspect of the jugular foramen or anterior, anterior, anterior lateral aspect of the jugular foramen. Here in the condyle, you can see the um, hyperglossal canal and this all correlates with this intradural anatomy of cranial nerves here below the tent of uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 in the jugular foramen and hyperglossal nerve down here. Returning to the retrosigmoid perspective um, of the jugular foramen in this case, we have nine, which is separated always by a small dural bend. So this is the nervous compartment of the jugular foramen, but still there's a subsegment uh, with a glossopharyngeal canal. So this is nine glossopharyngeal nerve. We have 10 coursing uh, here from the posterior lateral sulcus. And then again, the ascending fibers, cranial and spinal fibers for 11 and so coursing anteriorly with um, the hyperglossal, towards the hyperglossal nerve, we have the fibers of the hyperglossal canal, which anterior, which originate anterior to the olive from, um, from the anterior uh, medial sulcus. This again is a, is a more, um, more anterior view um, into the anterior aspect of the posterior fossa. So this is the, the pica, the pica tonsilla segment of the pica. We have vertebral artery and um, smaller arterial branches often connecting, as we know from, uh, from paragangliomas with the external circulation, ascending pharyngeal, occipital artery, the, um, the arterial um, anastomosis via the jugular foramen. Um, again, we can see the olive, posterior lateral and interromedial uh, sulcus of, of the uh, medulla. And this um, final exposure, just um, showing again an extended uh, view, not so the, so the inferior extension of this far lateral um, condylar, condylar exposure with the B3 segment of the vertebral artery, integral segment of the artery. And I just wanted to show this um, to, to demonstrate that, that the um, nerves coursing into the jugular foramen always run uh, medial and anterior to the jugular bulb and are not, uh, not at risk in this posterior uh, exposure. This is the extra kernel. Uh, course of uh, 9, 10, 11, and the uh, hyperglossal canal uh, fibers running. Um, no, this is uh, no, this is the uh, the ascending fibers. Hyperglossal canal obviously is exposed more anteriorly. This was just a brief review for this um, talk with um, for this session with a lot of speakers. I am, and as always, I wanted to um, thank my my mentors, and uh, not only in surgery but also in in, uris, uh, in microanatomy over the years. Mostly my my current chairman uh, Sebastian Frill here in Paris, and um, Juan Fernandez Miranda, and my my dear friend Maxi uh, Nunes, who is working in Stanford now, with whom I share a lot of pictures. Some of his pictures also in this talk, and a lot of ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Very interesting overview, anatomical overview, and it's uh, a perfect introduction before starting to the discussion on some technical aspect with an overview of the, the anatomy. Sebastian Frulich has to apologize. He cannot join us for his talk on some technical uh, tips for the opening, but uh, surely we will not blame uh, Sebastian since he's uh, very active for the section. We will see him the next time. So we will go directly to the next speaker, who is Pierre Groche from Marseille, who will discuss with us some uh, technical points to avoid CSF leakage after a retrosigmoid approach. Please, Pierre, up to you. Pierre. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. It's perfectly. Okay, so uh, what should I do to share my screen? Partager l'écran. Please, the arrow. Um, uh, it's, sorry for that. It's, it's, I hope it's coming very soon. Yes, it's Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. not yet in full mode. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, apply for a slideshow. Um, Okay, uh, dear colleagues, I'm happy to, to share this uh, uh, session with you. Uh, once again, thanks to the energy of uh, Michael Bruno, who is really a wonderful leader for our group. Uh, he's always stimulating us. And uh, I was, uh, I applied uh, very late and I'm sorry for that. 
Anyway, I, I would like to share with you a few uh, tips and uh, a few words about the, the CSF leaks, because as you may know, uh, even uh, in uh, experience at the hands, we still have some. And uh, I will uh, uh, go through some details with you during this very short and, and compact presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, all of us, we know that the retroseek approach as all the skull-based approaches carries risk and this risk as, uh, are mainly due to, uh, to the target that is, that is approach, which means that when you are uh, uh, managing an acoustic uh, schwannoma or meningioma or, uh, or epidermoid cyst, uh, the fact that you manage each kind of this, uh, of this disease carries its own risk. And you can see here on this uh, slide from Cohen Gadol that the complications which are honestly displayed here indicates a lot of potential complication, which are mostly linked to the management of the target by itself more than by the approach properly. But you can see that depending on the approach, you have difference between the risk. And uh, uh, that's funny to see that uh, uh, the, the potential risk for CSF leaks uh, is different uh, uh, according to the approach uh, coming from the middle fossa to the retro -sig or trans lab. You can see that in the hands of this, uh, of this group, this was, by the way, uh, uh, an analysis of the literature. They found that they had more uh, um, uh, CSF leaks with the retro -sig approach instead of the, of the trans lab or the middle cranial fossa, which is questionable because in, uh, 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 I, I'm not sure that these data are, are uh, cover the overlap the experience of all of us. Uh, anyway, um, uh, um, uh, Announcing that uh, there is a 10% of CSF leaks uh, through the retrosig approach is uh, is probably uh, is probably the, the good way to address because in my hands uh, and uh, we always think that we have a few complications but in my hands we operate in our group more than 600 retrosig patients and still we have some. And 10% uh, is not far from our, each of our, from our experience. Uh, probably Marcos will discuss about that, but 10% uh, seems to be a, a, a good, on average, a, a, good, a, a good number. Um, okay, uh, we, we, are, we are addressing the issue, not of the target, but of the approach. And when, uh, uh, when uh, exposing the, 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 the disease through the retroseg, it means that to, you will have to uh, open the bone, of course, to open the dura, and uh, probably in, in, uh, somehow to drill the mastoid, some part of the mastoid, and in some cases, probably much more for acoustic schwannomas than for meningiomas. We will have to drill the, the meatus, and in this place, there are some air cells that can be uh, exposed. So this exposure uh, of, the, uh, of the dura, of the cisterna, uh, of the CSF, and of the, of the, of the air cells, uh, carries some risk of CSF fistula. And we can classify uh, these fistulas in two different categories. Uh, the first one is incisional uh, uh, fistula, and the second one is uh, rhinorrhea. And uh, the way we have to manage these uh, two kinds of uh, CSF leaks is, is, is in, in, in my view, very different. Okay, uh, about, about the, the, the frequency uh, of, the, of the CSF uh, leaks, uh, I already told you the, in a previous uh, in a previous slide uh, the, the figures of all these uh, all these authors, and you can see that some hopefully have zero, and uh, some of them have a lot. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, we will have. Uh, if you already did not have any, you will have some, and you have to be prepared to have some to prevent that and to manage if it happens. Um, uh, about the, the, the risk factors, it's very difficult to, to uh, associate the, the risk of CSF fistula with preoperative and peroperative risk. Uh, the group from Majis Sani uh, more than 10 years ago published a paper in the DNS, and in their experience, they considered that uh, a redo surgery was a risk factor for CSF fistula, and they probably, uh, uh, they probably had a tendency uh, that uh, previous uh, uh, radio surgery would carry some risk, but they could not demonstrate that from a statistical uh, point of view. Uh, I personally operated more than 20 uh, failed gamma, and I do not consider that this is a potential risk for fistula because gamma is not a radiation technique like others, and uh, usually it doesn't give 
any scar on, on the dura and on the, 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 the soft tissue. That, so uh, I'm wondering whether this is a, a potential risk. In my hands, not, but we can discuss about that. Okay, this paper is very interesting because this was published uh, five or six years ago about the, the, the Mayo Clinic group with Michael Link with a huge experience of acoustic. And uh, they, they focused about the uh, uh, three uh, interesting parameters. The BMI, you, you, you may know that uh, in the US, unfortunately, they, they, they have a lot of overweight patients, which is an issue when we operate uh, skull-based tumors, of course. And uh, they, they could show uh, some statistical significance about the BMR of the patient and the risk of fistula. Uh, uh, again, they could show that the increase of the operative time uh, uh, increased the risk of, of, of the fistula. And they showed uh, that the translab approach, which is, which is not exactly the, the purpose of our talks, uh, could, what was a uh, was uh, positively uh, associated with an increased rate of, of CSF uh, fistula. Uh, I used to operate a lot of patients with a trans lab. I do not do anymore because it's not it's a, it's a demanding approach. And but in in my old experience of this approach, uh, we used such a huge amount of, of fat that I did not uh, I did not have the the. the the feeling that we had more fistula than when, than with the when, when, than with the retroceding approach, so BMI is probably an interesting point to consider. Um, anyway, in my in my experience about once again uh, hundreds of patients operate with retroceding, I did not find it as a as a significant predictor of fistula. To be honest, the, the more significant predictor I found, even so, I did not uh, statistically study that was the exposure, of course, of the mastoid. In case of patient with usually uh, a pneumatized uh, mastoid, the fact that, that you have to skeletonize the, the sigmoid sinus and to expose huge air cells, even though you take a lot of time to bone wax, to close, in this case, I had significantly more patients with post-op CSF uh, fistula. And this is the only significant parameters from my view, it's a little bit intuitive. It's not demonstrate, but exposure of big amount of air cells influence significant, significantly the risk of fistulas in, 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 my own, in my own group, in my own experience. So how to manage? This is very clear. Uh, in my opinion, incisional uh, uh, CSF fistulas are, uh, yeah, as a rule, uh, relatively easy to, to, to manage. Uh, usually, we, 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 we propose to the patient three lumbar puncture, uh, and for each of them, uh, with a big needle, uh, we withdraw more than 30 cc each. And of course, we recommend a mastoid pressure breathing. And in this case, the majority of them are uh, managed with this very simple way to do. In case it doesn't work, we go for lumbar drainage during five days, and of course, a mastoid pressure dressing. And to be honest, uh, as far as, as I can remember, I did not have to, to, to open again and to reoperate and uh, to offer a revision surgery in this case, because it always works. If it doesn't work, it probably means that the pressure of the CSF is too high. And it means that probably you will have to, to offer or to consider a, a shunt for this kind of patient. So the management of this one are very clear. Unfortunately, we could see uh, in one case, this kind of patient who was operated twice in, other, in another center with the CSF uh, oozing from the scar. And you see this kind of defect in this case, but you have some foreign, foreign body inside. You have titanium plates in, in the head and uh, probably some infections uh, uh, under, uh, under the skin, which explain the defect. And in this case, it's very complex to operate this patient. You have, of course, to remove all the foreign body. And probably in some case, and we published that years ago, you need the, the, the help of a plastic surgeon to uh, offer a, a, a patient, uh, the patient this kind of, uh, of vascularized flap. If you do not that, if you don't do that, you will be, it will be very difficult to manage. This is really exceptional situation. And you can see at the end that the result, the, the result is quite, it, it's quite acceptable. The other issue is about the rhinorrhea. Rhinorrhea it's, uh, is probably much more difficult to, to, to manage because in this case, it's usually useless 
to propose lumbar puncture. You, you, it's, 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 it's useless. Even if you offer Dimox to the patient, acetazolamide, plus the lumbar puncture, usually it doesn't work. We did that in the past. Nowadays, we go uh, straight ahead to the lumbar drainage during five days. Uh, the patient uh, keep bedridden, and uh, we will we will, we can we can control the, the CSF rate of uh, uh, of drainage. And in this case, usually uh, uh, not usually, but in in fifty percent of case, it's enough. But in fifty percent of case, it doesn't work, and you need to go for a revision surgery. Why? You can see in this uh, in this bone window CT scan that the opening of the air cells here. At the level of the mastoid is high. There is a big hole. You have a leak and the communication with the mastoid and, and the station tube. And in, the, in this case, uh, you need, this is very simple, to plug the hole with fat. This is the only uh, advice I could, I, I, I could show you. You, you. you remove the bone flap, you harvest the fat from the uh, abdominal fat, a big amount of that, and you can plug that. Of course, we use a fibre glue with that. But usually, uh, harvesting enough fat and plugging the hole uh, uh, in the mastoid with this is, is usually enough uh, to, to manage the, the, this issue. OK, so how to prevent? Prevention starts with the opening, of course. Uh, clear cut of the dura mater is the key. Uh, you keep it humid during the surgery, because otherwise, you have the retraction due to the light of the microscope. And usually, I, I stitch back. I stitch back with a running suture more than this kind of uh, differentiated uh, stitches here. Usually I close with a running suture here. You have to do that water tie. Of course, it's not enough. You have to plug systematically uh, with bone wax the, the, the mastoid. Even so you do not see any opening of any air cell, you have to plug systematically with bone wax. And usually the technique is to offer a kind of sandwich technique which means that I usually plug with bone, back, bone wax. Then I put the bone dust that I uh, uh, kept uh, uh, during my, my, my burr hole. And uh, uh, I mix the, the, this, uh, this bone dust with some, some tea seal. And then I put back the bone flap. And uh, as much as possible, you have to push the, the, bone, the, bone, uh, the bone flap against the mastoid to plug everything. So this is my, my, my way to, uh, to try to prevent uh, this kind of uh, this kind of CSF uh, uh, renoria. So at the conclusion, uh, it should never be overlooked. I remember a case, and I will end up with that of a, of a patient coming from North Africa. She was a 41 year old with a big acoustic. We operate this patient in Marseille. She 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 remained during two weeks in Marseille uh, uh, um, at the vicinity of the hospital. She was quite okay. And without any, any additional leak, she went back to her home, home village in a remote place in North Africa. And we heard two months later on that the patient experienced some CSF leak. Uh, she experienced some meningitis and she died of that. So you should never overlook this kind of complication. It's not so easy to prevent, even so we are experienced neurosurgeons and we, we have all of us, we have our different methods to do that. Anyway, it requires a meticulous opening, meticulous closure, and each of us, we have different protocol to manage when it happens. Okay, that's, that's all. I thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Very relevant to focus on this very important aspect. Uh, and indeed, you spend so much time to resect the vestibular schwannoma if you have a complication on the approach. Uh, uh, it will be a, a pity and uh, we should focus uh, on this point, uh, which is very important. So it's not time to move to Lyon. We remain in France. And to give the floor to uh, Timothy Jackson, who will discuss with us the place of uh, DTI in vestibular schwannoma surgery. Please, Timothy. We cannot listen to you, you are mute. Uh, is it okay for you? Yes, it's perfect. Yeah. Please. Uh, I will just share my screen.
I had connectivity issues, so I was late, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but now it's all right, and I just want to take a few minutes to thank, to thank uh, Stefan, because the pictures were amazing. And uh, I spent time in uh, Pittsburgh, too, with uh, Juan Fernandez Nironda, and uh, it was a great time. Uh, so I, uh, I can see and can recognize the, the style the rotten style on these pictures, so it's uh, it's very uh, a, a pleasure to, to see this kind of picture. So I try to share my screen, but uh, do you see my screen right now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. okay. Just uh, go back to Zoom. And uh, yeah. in, indeed, I confirm it's a fantastic job of Stefan. He truly have taken so many hours to obtain such pictures. Sure. Congrats, Stefan. Okay. Yes, I'm here. So I think that's that's good right now. Yes. Yeah. Not yet in full mode, but. Uh, yeah. Are we good? That's it. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for everyone to allow me to do this presentation and to share my experience. Do you hear me well? It's, it's all right for the, the sound, right? Everything is perfect. Okay. So thank you very much. I just wanted to give you uh, an insight of what we can do with uh, tractography to improve the the, the surgery or the preoperative planning for such a retrosigmoid approach. So the beginning of, of my, my talk will, will be about just a quick reminder of surgical anatomy, but I don't want you to um, go more, more far than, uh, than Stefan because these pictures were also amazing. I will give you some principle about uh, uh, MR diffusion tractography, and then I will explain two uh, types of tractography. The first will be uh, a Roy region of interest based uh, fiber tracking, and the second will be a full uh, tractography. So I just want you to, uh, to give you this, uh, this summary first. I, I won't uh, take too much time for the retro SIG approach, but just to, to say it's one of the uh, most popular approach for the skull-based tumors. And uh, uh, the important point is, uh, we use a pointer, yeah. Uh, we will cross uh, some cranial nerves uh, of the skull base, and we will cross a lot of cranial nerves, like the, the fifth, the acoustic fascial bundle, and the lower nerves, maybe the, the twelfth. And uh, it's a very, uh, it's very important to, uh, to remind the position, the orientation of each uh, nerve uh, to uh, anticipate the, you know, the traps for any uh, skull-based surgery. So when we, uh, we do the retro SIG approach, we cross this area, we open the, this piece of bone just behind the sigmoid sinus, right? And then that's important to, to remind that we will be in the narrow space crossing a lot of cranial nerves uh, in the posterior cranial fossa. You can see in this endocranial view of the temporal bone, uh, this groove, which is the bone for the uh, superior petrous uh, sinus, and then see the, 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 the level of the internal acoustic matrix, which is quite high if you, if you see the, the wall petrous pyramid. That's a, an important point to, to remind. And another point is the level of the jugular foramen there. And it's just a, a, an insight, a recall of the position of cranial nerves in the posterior cranial fossa. So the retro secret approach would be there, just uh, uh, below the level of the asterion, uh, behind the, the base of the, of the mastoid process, and uh, to be exactly at the edges of the lateral and sigmoid parts of the transverse sinus, right? And that's very important if you consider to do retro approach 
to be exactly at the edges of the sigmoid and the lateral sinus. And you can find uh, this level using the no navigation system, but also using uh, uh, anatomical landmarks. If you uh, can feel the, the beginning the, of the zygomatic process, you can also feel the Indian and you draw a line between these two landmarks and you will be exactly uh, above the, the sinus. And uh, most of the time, just anterior to the astern, you can feel a bone depression, uh, which is exactly a posterior to the mastoid process because at this level specifically, uh, the, the bone will be just a little bit inferior and you can feel a, a bone depression because of the bump uh, of the mastoid process there. So this little bone depression will be exactly the level where you can do your first burr hole uh, for the retrosig uh, chronotomy. So this is the uh, patient positioning. You can see the asterion. And you can see that uh, you can start your uh, drawing or your first bowl just a little bit inferior and anterior to the uh, to the asterion, posterior to the base of the mastoid process, and interior to the low to the line drawn by the uh, zygomatic process and the union. So it's just a few. A uh, few remarks of the few comments of the uh, surgical anatomy. So I like this one because it's the anatomy uh, already presented a few minutes before, but it's in the operative view, in the operative assay. So you can see on the right side, up is on the left, uh, down on the right, and you can see the trigeminal nerve, and then the acoustic fascial bundle. The nine, the tenth, the eleven, with its two branches, and in the deepness you can see the sixth nerve, the abdescence one. So it's good to remind all of this disposition of the cranial nerves when you do the retrosig approach, and remind that this orientation of the cranial nerves will be a little bit different because the trigeminal nerve will uh, go uh, posterior anterior, quite straightforward. Uh, while the acoustic fascial bundle and the lower nerve would be like more medial lateral, quite perpendicular to the trigeminal trajectory. So it's, it's important to, to remind this point specifically. You can see the, this little structure there, which are the choroid plexuses, exactly uh, anterior at the level of the Lushka foramen. And this is the flocculus. So, if you look at the, the cerebellum uh, lamella there, and you can see the flocculus, and the acoustic facial bundle will be just anterior to the flocculus and above the level of the choroid plexuses. So it's important to remind these points. If you search your acoustic facial bundle, you just need to identify the, the, the flocculus, and it will be easy to identify the acoustic facial bundle. And if you want to stimulate the facial nerve, you uh, have to remind that the facial nerve will be superior and anterior, uh, considering the acoustic facial bundle. But there is a little uh, uh, subtlety that the acoustic fa facial bundle, uh, the acoustic facial nerve, uh, sorry, the facial nerve will turn around the acoustic facial bundle. Because at the level close to the brainstem, the facial nerve will be inferior, and then it turns around behind the acoustic facial bundle to become superior uh, at the proximity of the porous. That's a very important point. I just want to make this comment for the younger neurosurgeons that can uh, watch this uh, video, right? So um, some comments about the MRI diffusion tractography. The MRI is able to detect the orientation of the diffusion of water molecules along white fibers in the brain. 
at the first point is you can see diffusion, which has a Brownian movement in the all direction. If you consider this uh, uh, cup of water, this box of water, but along the fibers, the white fibers in the brain, the orientation or the diffusion of water molecules is constrained along the trajectory of white fibers. So that's very important to remind this point and for you know understanding the, the tractography. And there are uh, after that the different mathematical algorithms that you can apply uh, to reconstruct the trajectory uh, of the four white fibers. First point. And more and more, the, tra the tractography is evolving because it was developed at the beginning of the 21st century in the thousands of um, years. Uh, and at the beginning, it was all about DTI, which, has, which is the tractography using, based on the diffusion tensor. And the diffusion tensor is able only to detect or to uh, depict uh, one orientation of white matter fibers. And then the diffusion model is changing little by little. And now uh, we use more the ODF, which is a mathematical, uh, which is um, a view and insight of the probability of diffusion along different direction. And it's uh, best, uh, it's the best model diffusion because it's able uh, to uh, depack more than one uh, direction of the diffusion of water molecule within the brain. So that's quite complex, but it's very important to understand this, the, the, the history of the tractography uh, to, uh, to understand how to do it in the clinical practice. So, the tractography is not only one step, but it's a multiple step pipeline from the MRI acquisition, then ROI design, tracking process using the mathematical algorithm, then filtering of ground truth control, then the visualization, and then the validation uh, during surgery if possible. So how we do that? Uh, yeah, I will talk uh, about that just a few minutes after. The thing is, if you look at uh, the MRI, like uh, high resolution T2 MRI, you can identify most of cranial nerves, actually. On these T2 pictures of the natural uh, slice of the MRI, you can identify the optic nerves very easily. But the same for the oculomotor nerves, the trigeminal nerves, the acoustic fascial bundles, the lower nerve, and the hypoglossal nerves. But the problem is in case of skull based tumors, if you look at these pictures on the healthy side, it's easy to, to see the trajectory of the acoustic fascial bundle. But on the tumor side, it's not easy. And most of the time, you can't identify properly the trajectory of cranial nerves, which are displaced or stretched around the, the, the tumor volume. So that's a, a big issue. You can identify a three germinal nerve on the LC side, but on the tumor side, it's not easy. That's why we, we used, firstly, a region of interest-based tracking. The principle is to apply on a T2 map, an ODF map that gives you a merge map with ODF signals uh, superimposed on T2 map. You can zoom a little bit and you will identify the best balance between the ODF, which are the, I, I just want to record that. It's uh, an, an insight of the probability of the diffusion of water molecules along the white fibers in the brain. So these pictures, these models, these symbols uh, can be uh, superimposed on the classical T2 map. And if you find the best balance 
between the T2 and the DODF, you can follow the uh, cranial nerves. And then you can put some region of interest and you can apply a mathemat mathematical algorithm. It gives you this kind of pictures. And then you can follow in our experience, most cranial nerves maybe at the, except the force, which is very, very thin, uh, it's possible for, for the all the all other cranial nerves. So on this specific example that we just previously seen, uh, we were able to identify the trajectory of the facial nerve at the anterior pole of this vestibular trauma. And the other example was a petroclival meningioma. And it was very hard to identify where the trigeminal nerve where this, this was displaced. And I just wanted to show you a sagittal view of this. On a sagittal view, it's more easy to understand that the trigeminal nerve is pushed inferiorly uh, at the, the, the peripheral area of this uh, petroclival meningioma. And uh, we use this uh, technique during uh, the first years of the, our experience in tractography. I just wanted to show you this example of a big uh, arachnoid cyst. And we apply this roy based tracking and we try to identify the, the way the cranial nerves were pushed away or were uh, located in this specific uh, environment of the tumor of these cysts. Sometimes it's hard to, to identify them, but you can move the 3D rendering of cranial nerve tractography to try to mimic the retrosig uh, approach and the retrosig surgical view uh, at the beginning of the approach. And we were able to do that. And we were, we were able the way to anticipate the way the trigeminal where was pushed superiorly and anteriorly. And it was, uh, so it, uh, it uh, gave us some confidence at the beginning of the surgery uh, to identify the, the cranial nerves very early and to move fast during the surgery um, with, uh, with a more safe and uh, accurate uh, surgical removal or opening of, the, of this arachnoid cyst. So that's the way we, we first used uh, this road based tractography. But uh, from Time to time, we realized that it was quite hard to apply it in the clinical routine because it required a lot of steps from the acquisition, the post-treatment, the algorithm, the definition, the design of the region of interest. So we tried to think differently and to, to say, okay, we need to reduce to limit at maximum the steps that will be dependent of the user. So why not uh, trying to avoid the region of interest and designing like a big region of interest at the, the pictures in B, and then we negated uh, the region of interest to create this unique region, and then we apply the tractography in this full, this whole volume, including the tumor, the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the cranial nerves trajectory, the systems of the skull base. And we get this result with a specific color code. In green, you have fibers coming anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior. In uh, red, these are fibers that coursing medial to lateral or lateral medial, and in blue, fibers that uh, 
and go up to down, down to up. And as you can see, this kind of uh, uh, full tractography was quite accurate. And it, it was able to depict very precisely uh, the different, different trajectories of coordinates. V1, V2 is cut there. V3 is diving inferiorly. The lower, the lower nerve, the acoustic fascial bundle. So it was quite uh, accurate, actually. And uh, that's the direction in which we are moving right now. Uh, I give uh, a, a, an insight Sorry. of. Uh, yeah, so I could uh, just switch up the the the, the sound. Having adjusted a region of interest that included a brainstem, so unique region of interest. This roy was negated to create a unique region of avoidance. Then a full tractography was initiated. Using the quantitative anisotropy based deterministic algorithm. So that's very simple. After slight filtering, very easy, two dimensional rendering in the and very fast. The software allows rotation and magnification on demand. The following prior nerves were identified optic nerves, the third, the fifth, the sixth, the lower nerve, and the acoustic fascial band. Some of them were tracked not only in their systemic trajectory. But also the cavernous and orbital segments. The brainstem preparation was well seen. This full tractography rendering led to a better understanding of each pain. So that was this kind of insight I wanted to, to show you. And uh, it was a vestibular schwannoma, so not very appropriate for retro seek uh, purpose, but that's why I had I, I, this, uh, this second case. I do it for every uh, skull, complex skull-based uh, tumor, but in this case, it was a little bit more uh, obvious, but I did exactly the same uh, post-treatment. It's supposed to take 15 minutes maximum. It's supposed to avoid um, the, the, any user-related or user-dependent step. And at the end, uh, we hope it will provide an insight of the anatomical environment of the tumor, the way the tumor pushed the brainstem, and the way the tumor displaced the coronal nerves around. So on this picture, you can see that the, the trigeminal nerve pushed superiorly and uh, laterally to, to, the, to the tumor. It was a big, um, uh, big uh, uh, meningioma of the inferior uh, patrial cypex inferior petroclaval area. So it's just an example that how we can uh, use uh, the, the tractography in the clinical practice. And we work very hardly to make it feasible in the daily practice, because from the beginning, the tractography is like a tool uh, for, you know, for computer guys. Uh, and we were very hardly to, to make it uh, usable for any neurosurgeon. We want to do a uh, sorrows uh, uh, preoperative planning. And for any neurosurgeon who wants to anticipate the position of coronary nerve displaced around this kind of skull bay tumors. So, yeah, we, we try to apply the same uh, uh, pipeline of full tractography for uh, uh, a case. Uh, from the human connectome project database, just to show that it's possible to do the same uh, pipeline uh, for any kind of uh, DTI data you can you can get. So that's it. I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you you will have interest in this uh, in this tool, and I can give you a different insight on different. Uh, advice if you want to try to use it in your in your practice. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Timothy, for sharing with us your experience and uh, this fantastic tool in line, in fact, with the talk of Pierre in order to decrease the post-operative morbidity by improving the preoperative planning. So it's for me 
a good way to make the transition with the next speaker, who is uh, Professor uh, Calamarides. Can you start to share your screen, maybe, Timothy? Yes, uh, of course. Um, thank you so much, uh, Michel, to be with us uh, this evening. It's the first time that you join us. It's truly a pleasure for me to welcome you. You are working in uh, La Pitié Salpêtrière in Paris. And I have the chance to see how you master the retrosigmoid approach and the way to, to treat vestibular schwannomas. And you will also detail with us this evening how the management of uh, the electrophysiology, the facial nerve monitoring, and the auditory monitoring will influence your surgery also to decrease the postoperative mobility. So please, up to you, Michel. Thank you, Michael, for your invitation. I'm very pleased to be there with you. Uh, I will uh, discuss about Shanoma, just a few words about our current philosophy in vestibular Shanoma surgery, because it's very important. It will explain what we are doing. Now our team is treating only uh, the large Shanoma by surgery, and all the small and medium progressive lesions are treated by radiosurgery. So uh, it's very important to understand the natural history of the small tumor to decide the treatment and tailor the treatment. The second uh, philosophy, I would say, it's that uh, functional result, it's uh, more important than the quality of resection. And over the years with Olivier Serkers, we changed our mind for vestibular schwannoma surgery. And uh, we, it's clear that the functional price to be paid for a total removal is too high. And what we want now is to avoid facial palsy. And uh, the last, uh, based on the experience, for example, in Marseille, we monitor the possible remnants and treat only in case of growth. But I think that one point is very important to evaluate and define what is the quality of tumor resection. It's not clear in the literature. So in, the, in my talk, I will define gross total resection as no tumor according to the surgeon and confirmed by MRI. Near total resection is when you leave a small piece of tumor and you see nothing on MRI. For us, it's not a gross total resection. And then there is a subtotal resection when you leave a small tumor and you can see on MRI a small piece of tumor less than 0.5 centimeter cube. And more than uh, this volume, it's a partial resection. Mostly it's decide before surgery. And you see in this example on the right, this is a MRI performed two day, uh, the day after surgery. Uh, it, was a total, it was a near total resection. You can see no uh, gadolinium enhancement. And we, we did another MRI one month later, and you see a, a linear gadolinium enhancement. So the timing of the post-op MRI is very important. Do immediately or a few months later, not at one month. OK. So during surgery, uh, you know that there are some uh, uh, different uh, course uh, of the facial nerve. Uh, we define three based on the Jackler work. And this is uh, the most difficult uh, trajectory when the facial is very high, close to the fifth nerve. And uh, we, uh, we published this paper uh, three years ago in uh, GNS uh, to show that the uh, intraoperative monitoring of the facial nerve is used to guide the quality of the resection. It's not used to, to see where is the facial nerve. Uh, we know, so at the beginning, maybe yes, but we use this to help to decide when to stop resection. And to do this, we, uh, in this paper, we analyzed 25 patients with not a gross total resection. And we, uh, we, uh, we stimulate the facial nerve at the brainstem at the beginning of the surgery as high intensity at two milli, milli, uh, milliampere. And uh, we continue the resection uh, until uh, a loss of 50% uh, of the response at two milli, uh, two milli, milliampere. And with this strategy, we obtain um, a nice, uh, good, uh, 
post-operative facial function, one and two Hausen uh, Brackman, in 84% uh, of the patients. Then it's uh, in this uh, new series of patients uh, with surgery uh, during one year uh, for large uh, sporadic vesicular schwannoma, we uh, decide to use uh, the supramaximal uh, stimulation at two milliampere, and we decide to stop the resection when we obtain a decrease in 40%. So you have to stimulate regularly at the brainstem at two milliampere just to, to evaluate the, the results and the amplitude. And when you have a loss more than 40%, we, you have to stop. And with this strategy, uh, we obtain uh, a good result at one year in uh, 95%. And you see the quality of the resection. Uh, we obtain, uh, uh, I, I will go back now, I will go this. We obtain uh, a nice resection in uh, a lot of cases, more than uh, 80%. You see uh, the uh, post-operative House and Brackman function in this series, and you see there is some uh, worsening of the facial at day eight, but you see uh, it's 95% uh, at one year. And this is how we are thinking now uh, when we uh, do uh, vestibular schwannoma resection. We expose the facial nerve at the brainstem. So it's easier through a translab approach. Sometimes for the retrosigmoid, retro it's more difficult because you don't want to push the eight nerve and the facial nerve. And then you do a first uh, measurement of the supramaximal at two milliampere. It's a baseline. Then you will see the adhesion of the facial nerve and you go to monitor regularly the response. And when you have a decrease more than 40%, and today it's 30%, then you stop the resection. It means you, you stop the resection between the facial nerve and the tumor. So you can remove the tumor, but you don't touch anymore to the facial nerve. So just to summarize the facial nerve dissection, uh, we using the monitoring to guide. Now, we stop the resection if the intraoperative supramaximal response decreased by more than 40%. Uh, we have two other uh, elements just to be more cautious. When at two milliampere, you have a, a bad response, less than 1,000, it means that the facial nerve is stretched by the tumor and you have to be very careful. And then, for sure, when during the surgery you see a strong adhesion between the tumor and the facial nerve at the end of the resection, even if the response is very good, sometimes you leave a small part. So it's a way to have a good postoperative facial function, even in the large. The challenge, hearing preservation for large vestibular schwannoma. A few years ago, I started the vestibular schwannoma surgery 25 years ago. Now I, I've, I've done more than 1,500 uh, tumors, but at the beginning, every large schwannoma was removed by a translabyrinthine approach. And with Olivier Sterkers a few years ago, we changed our mind because we observed that the, it was okay for the facial nerve even through a retrosigmoid approach. And we decided to try to, to present the large vestibular schwannoma hearing. This is... Uh, an interesting new paper published uh, last month by the uh, uh, Mayo Clinic team analyzing their results for hearing preservation for large vestibular schwannoma. And you can see that for tumor larger than uh, 15 millimeter in the CP angle using a retro approach, they have only 10% uh, of hearing preservation. And when the tumor is uh, larger than 25%, it's only 6%. So for them, hearing preservation for very large phenomena, it's maybe a dream, and it's not. Uh, it's difficult to, to re realize uh, this uh, challenge. So, how can you monitor uh, hearing during vestibular schwannoma surgery? You have the ABR, and we uh, published this paper last year showing that in fact, 
Yes, it, it, it's interesting to monitor ABR, but it's rare to have a synchronized ABR for very large phenomena. And we think that what is interesting with ABR, it's more interesting as a positive predictor factor. So when you have a synchronized ABI, ABR, you have a five times greater chance of preserved hearing compared to the cases with desynchronized ABR. So in our series, we preserve hearing in 46% of patients with synchronized ABR. So in this series, it was a large and medium-sized tumor. But when ABR was not present, it was rare to preserve hearing. The next step is to use uh, the cochlear nerve auditory portal shell to monitor. What is uh, this uh, technique? In fact, you, you, pu you put this ball on the nerve and you will monitor the wave two of ABR with a large signal. So you have an acquisition every four seconds because for ABR it's every 30 seconds. So it's very difficult to stop uh, uh, a surgery uh, using ABR monitoring. You don't know what you are doing with the cochlear nerve, but with the CNAP, every four seconds, you have a signal and you can, uh, you can stop your, your, uh, the surgery. So you need to see the cochlear nerve and it's difficult to stabilize this small ball. And when you have loss of the amplitude more than 40%, you have to stop. So now, uh, I use, I modify the strategy compared to the trans uh, resection. So this is a case of vestibular schonoma. And I start, I, I start by monitoring uh, the uh, eight nerve by the TNAP. So you, sometimes it's very difficult to see the eight nerve at the bottom of the tumor. So I monitor like for the facial and you can get some response sometimes. So you can see or imagine where is the cochlear nerve. Then uh, I remove all the superior part uh, of the tumor. Uh, and finally, using a dynamic monitoring, so it, you can move the, the ball and you can then uh, try to remove the, the tumor from the cochlear nerve uh, using the knap. And when you have a loss of signal, you have to stop. And then you put here to, to remove this. And when you drill at the end, you can put your, uh, the ball here, and then you can monitor because the patient has a microphone. So you record the signal from the, the cochlea to the ball. So uh, we uh, this is a, a small series of 37 uh, uh, cases. You see it's a medium size of the tumor, cause for in 84%, 82%. In this series of post-operative facial nerve function was 95, always using our strategy to, uh, to, uh, of guidance by the monitor, facial monitoring. You see the quality of resection in this series. So uh, it's, uh, you see uh, near total, subtotal also. Uh, normal MRI in 76% uh, uh, of cases. And uh, we uh, were able to uh, get a CNAP signal as a brainstem in half of the patient. Because at the beginning, you need to remove the tumor. So maybe you can damage the cochlear nerve. Maybe the CSF, open, uh, the opening of the cisterna uh, with CSF leakage is not good for the cochlear nerve, we don't know. And uh, then we were able to monitor during the removal of the vestibular schonoma. And you see when uh, the uh, CNAP uh, technique was present, we were able to get a better uh, results for hearing uh, preservation. And sometimes we had to stop the resection because the loss of amplitude and then in this case, you can preserve hearing like for the facial nerve. So we had some case of uh, hearing preservation uh, because the CNAP monitoring say, okay, you have to stop. And uh, what is very interesting, I'm learning 
when I lose hearing during surgery. And now I'm like for the facial nerve, you can learn uh, and you have a learning curve with the uh, uh, cochlear nerve. So you can uh, lose hearing uh, in the APC or during the, the drilling or at the uh, dissection in the meatus. So it's very interesting. And the last, I, I'm sure that we have a lot of microvascular damage. And sometimes you have, you are not doing nothing, you are doing nothing on the cochlear nerve and you are suddenly losing the knap. I think it's vascular. And we are using papaverine. And at the end of the resection, if you have not, if you have no knap at the fundus and at the brainstem, it means that the cochlear nerve is totally destroyed and it's vascular. In contrast, if you have a, a, a signal at the fundus, but not at the brainstem, it means that something happened, happened on the on, on the nerve during the dissection. So it doesn't help uh, to uh, preserve, but you can make a diagnosis of the loss of hearing and it helps uh, a lot of. So just for the retro sigmoid approach, uh, just with uh, uh, monitoring, you see at the beginning, this is uh, probably the eight nerve. You can put this ball and you have a signal. And then you can leave the ball and you remove the superior part of the tumor as uh, uh, Marco Tagliba will, will show. It's classical, so you can go very quickly. There is uh, no eight, no uh, seven nerve. And then you can uh, decrease. You, you see here the facial nerve as this part. This is a facial. You can see this is uh, trigeminal. And then you can continue to remove the tumor from the facial nerve. And then we will, we put the ball on the eight, just because now we will drill the met, the porous. So when you drill the porous and when you remove the last part, you will have control of the eight nerve. And you see, you can cut so this part is done by the is done by the ENT. So I'm doing a lot of surgery now with uh, Daniele Bernadeschi. So it's a team work, and you see this is a facial. This is the eight nerve. So an example of a tumor. It's not a large one, and uh, it was a subtotal resection. We preserve. We had to stop three times during surgery. It was 30 seconds each time. And we preserve hearing. It's, it's before, after. And there is a stable re residual. You see the residual. And you see this is uh, when you put again, it was, you, it's uh, like this. So in conclusion, I think that uh, facial uh, monitoring and hearing monitoring, it's a teamwork with EMT. So I'm doing all the surgery with the ENT. Before it was with Olivier Sterkers, now, it, now it's with Daniele Bernadeschi and Jan Nguyen. I think that we can say that the facial nerve function is preservation is acquired, but you know it's sometimes very difficult. And there are some additional challenge for hearing preservation for the very large vestibular schonoma. There is a learning curve. I think vascularization, papaverin, we have the difficulty of the lack of response initially when we try to, when we see the cochlear nerve, maybe it's too late. So for the uh, CNAP monitoring, maybe it's too late. Uh, what is difficult for the hearing preservation, we need a, a, a neurophysiologist in the room because for facial nerve, we can monitor by ourselves, but for the hearing, you need someone to say stop. And now we, try, we, we want to select the patient based on hearing and ABR, not on tumor volume. So we have a new theory in progress with uh, 70 large vestibular schonoma operated on using CNAP, but for such tumor, we are still using translab approach. I don't know how, how to remove and preserve hearing for such big vestibular schonoma. Thank you. 
thank you so much, Michel, for sharing with us your experience and uh, the way you deal with uh, auditory and facial nerve monitoring to influence your surgery and finally decrease the, the morbidity. Thank you. So now we will move to listen to the talk of Marcos Tatagiba. I think it's not necessary to present who is Marcos. He already participated to so many webinars with us and uh, is mastering also the retrosigmoid approach and the treatment, the surgical treatment of vestibular schwannoma. So Marcos, please, up to you. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for the kind invitation and to, to have the opportunity to participate in this fantastic uh, webinar. I would like to congratulate the previous speakers for the fantastic lectures they gave uh, to us. And I would like to contribute with our experience using the retrosigmoid approach to different type of uh, vestibular schwannomas, showing some technical details as we used to do in tubing. So uh, everybody who is dealing with these lesions uh, know that um, we are going to deal with a different kind of tumors, although all of them are schwannomas. And you see uh, vestibular schwannomas may appear completely different, and we have to decide differently in each case. <clears throat> in the past, we adapted the approach to the patient and to the size of the tumor, but nowadays we use in basically all cases a uh, retrosigmoid approach. Our philosophy is to use uh, radio surgery, uh, particularly in those cases of uh, elderly uh, patients with uh, small tumors which are growing. So if the tumor is not growing, we don't do anything. And if the patient is very young, we don't send the patients to radio surgery. So in young patients, we go for surgery uh, in order to cure the disease. And uh, in, in small tumors, we have an excellent chance for facial nerve preservation and even a good chance for hearing preservation. And in our experience doing a follow-up of 10 years in such cases, we have seen that in most cases, hearing will uh, be stable over the years, different than radio surgery in which a hearing will deteriorate over the years. So surgical indications in our department are those ones, uh, large tumors with brainstem compression, cystic tumors, young patients. If the uh, main complaint is uh, really vestibular related, then uh, we perform a vestibular neurectomy. And have two patients we use to decompress the tumor uh, and keeping the, 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 the function of facial and hearing if it's possible. And of course, patients' individual decision uh, have, has to be respected. The goals are, of course, cure if it's possible, or at least stabilization of the disease while we are preserving quality of life. As I said, uh, in the past, we used to adapt the approach to the tumor. Nowadays, we have seen that all these cases can be very well approached via the uh, retrosigmoid approach. And that's the reason I prefer to, uh, to keep on this approach, to stay there and, and to teach my residents uh, to do like this. So this is the experience we have accumulated in Tübingen in the last 16 years, or in all cases using retrosigmoid approaches. Uh, regarding electrophysiology, where for facial nerve, we use uh, uh, the stimulation of course during surgery, but also motor evoked potentials. And um, these, uh, particularly the motor evoked potentials are important in large tumors. Um, as long as uh, the, the MEPs are uh, excellent, so we, we are satisfied and we are not worried that we have damaged uh, the facial nerve, even if the visualization is not very well in large tumors. Um, in particularly cases, we can uh, perform a, a free running uh, stimulation of the facial nerve. If uh, particularly in sitting position, if the patient has air accumulated between uh, the subdural space and the skull, we may have deterioration of MEP because of the air accumulation so that this uh, direct stimulation will be very useful. And in particular cases of, uh, of um, bad auditory evoked potentials, but still with uh, uh, hearing function, 
we used to uh, uh, put the recordings directly on the cochlear nerve in order to get better waves. Um, I used to say that uh, the retrosigmoid approach is actually the pterional approach for the posterior fossa. It must be learned by all residents. It's extremely useful and important approach, and it's good uh, to learn and, and it's not difficult to teach. So, and the, 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 the correct retrosigmoid approach, in my opinion, is that one which is uh, uh, showing just the border of this transverse sinus, just the border of the sigmoid sinus. We go down up uh, the, the point that skull base is completely horizontal, leaving no, no parts of the bone hindering the access, access to the, the posterior fossa. And in order to avoid CSF leakage on the wound, we used to open the dura mater with a single incision along to the transverse and the sigmoid sinus. So I don't do additional cuts. I don't do flap of the dura, just a single incision. It will make the suture later on easier. Uh, we have uh, listened the lecture of Dr. Lieber showing the uh, beautiful anatomy of the cerebellopontine angle. Of course, if we have a tumor here, this anatomy will be uh, changed. Depending on the, on the size of the tumor, we put the patient uh, in supine or semi-sitting position. Why? In, in large tumors, uh, using the semi-sitting position, we have seen that surgery is faster in semi-sitting position. So you see here, all of these cases are T4 tumor, average time skin to skin to remove this tumor was four hours going from uh, two to six hours in average. Uh, uh, in semi-city position, we have seen the quality of life, uh, quality of, of surgery is better. So uh, we could achieve a higher uh, tumor uh, resection in, in using the semi-city position in comparison to supine position. And we have seen that um, that facial nerve preservation in semi-sitting position, both immediately after surgery and later on uh, was better. And uh, the, um, the contraindications or, or the, the collateral uh, problems related to semi-sitting position um, are really um, not, uh, should not be uh, overestimated. It, this is, um, we have done here this study in more than 800 patients with semi city position for different causes. And you see in no single case, we had hemodynamic instability. Um, a, a, a problem was in 3% of the patients, that means three patients in 100 had air accumulation at the subadural space that had to be removed with a saline solution. We make a puncture of of the subdural space, and we exchange R uh, from um, uh, exchange R and, and air and, and, and saline solution. So this is the only point. Otherwise, uh, no really problem related with uh, with uh, air embolism. So the surgical technique was um, the craniotomy uh, during incision like this, as you can see here, and exposing this area. Then um, there is some echo, I don't know where it is coming from, but uh, you see here, this is the exposure of this, of this area. And then opening the dura mater here at the area of the tubing line. If you can see here, this is the area we use to cut the dura mater. If you follow the anatomy of the petrous bone, you are gonna see that in this area, the dura is not very uh, tightly at, attached to the petrous bone and all these lines end in a certain point. This line here, this level will represent the inferior border of the internal auditory canal. So you continue here, the first step is drilling and afterwards to evacuate in the content of the internal auditory canal in order to, to have a, a distal control of the cochlear and the facial nerve. 
So because, because we usually cannot see directly the fundus of the intern auditory canal with a retrosigmoid approach, if we are going to preserve hearing and preserve the rabelent block, so we can use the endoscope to make this directly visualization. Using this technique, we can replace completely the advantage of the middle fossa in terms of directly exposure of the fundus. So endoscopic uh, tool is uh, for this kind of technique uh, very useful. So I would like to show briefly a couple of cases. Initially, uh, a small tumor. Uh, we did in supine position. First step is to open the system after a linear incision of the dura mater, as I told. So this is the cochlear nerve here and the tumor. Then uh, we cut the dura over the, um, the area where the internal auditory canal uh, is to be expected. And then um, we drill away uh, these bone. You see here, we, we don't transpass this area because otherwise we are going to uh, enter maybe the jugular bulb. Then we open these. I go a little bit fast, faster. So this is the exposure, wide exposure, wide exposure of the uh, intern auditory canal. This patient had a high jugular bulb. We uh, had to skeletonize it a little bit. Then uh, we open the dura mater and we start the tumor dissection. So I put here a little bit faster. Uh, tumor is, uh, is, evacue, is uh, debulked. And then with a cavitron, even small tumors can be diminished in size first before we start the dissection of the facial nerve above and of the cochlear nerve below. And then under careful um, electrophysiological control of auditory evoked potentials and the facial MEP, we dissect the tumor from the tumors away, from the nerves away and uh, you see, we, are, we irrigate a lot of times with papaverin, as uh, uh, Michel has shown in his uh, lecture. We use the same papaverin solution during surgery. And then, you know, you see this kind of uh, two hands dissection. So with one hand, we hold the tumor. With the other hand, we separate the structures from uh, the tumor surface. And so this way we can do really a careful um, dissection without damaging these structures. So at the end, we have uh, removed the tumor totally, but we have to control it. And using the endoscope, you see the hydroglobulb that can be seen here at the CT scan. And, uh, and then you can see the uh, fundus transverse crest, facial nerve, cochlear nerve, and uh, another tool, another um, 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 opportunity the endoscope is giving to us is to dive, de detect opened air cells. You see here some opened air cells, you will miss under the microscope. And this is one big cause of a CSF leakage as uh, Pierre has shown. So our technique to avoid it is to close directly under endoscope with bone wax, and then we put muscle and fibrin glue. So this is the technique we are using to avoid uh, CSF leakage from the, from the internal auditory canal. So another case um, is um, a, a little bit larger one. I have shown this case a couple of times because it's very illustrative. Um, a second. Yes. And uh, this is a young patient, a lawyer who wanted to get married, have children. So uh, we discussed all options, radiation or surgery. 
And uh, of course, she decided for surgery because she want to get pregnant and, uh, and have children, was very much afraid concerning radiation in her young age. So you see opening the uh, internal auditory canal and then visualization with endoscope. You can see some tumor remnant here that we have to remove. And this was removed. And then I go a little bit forward. You see debulking of the tumor and then the technique for dissection. You see here with one hand, we hold the arachnoid and the perineurium. We do not touch the, the, the nerves itself. And then um, tumor is removed. The advantage of sitting position is that you have a clear view of the field. We almost don't use bipolar. In my opinion, bipolar is really a poison to the nerve structures. Um, and then finally, again, uh, we close the opened air cells with bone wax and muscle and fibrin glue. Now a little bit larger case, this patient had good hearing before surgery with a larger tumor. And our goal was here, try to remove everything if it's possible, otherwise to do a subtotal removal and preserve uh, the function. Yes, so I, I will go a little bit faster. So this is the exposure, uh, sigmoid sinus, and uh, this is a linear incision of the dura mater, you see, and later on we can close it easily. Then we open the cistern. You can see the first uh, structures you can visualize are the lower cranial nerves. And then we don't retract uh, these areas, we just hold the cerebellum, and even in large tumors, we start a dissection uh, uh, with the internal auditory canal. We open the internal auditory canal and we evacuate as much as possible under careful control of the monitoring. So I go a little bit faster to show you uh, the further steps. Then we make a debulking. And then we can be very comfortable here because within vestibular schwannomas, there, there is no nerve, there is no vessel, nothing different than meningiomas. And then after debulking, we can recognize the, 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 the cochlear nerve. The cochlear nerve is, is, is visualized. And then we start the same type of dissection I have demonstrated uh, earlier. Uh, you see facial nerve, and the cochlear nerve with irrigation using papaverin. And uh, we touch only perineurium and arachnoid. And slowly, slowly, the tumor is dissected. And at the end, we could perform a near total resection. A very thin piece of the tumor remained behind. I can show you, you see here this thinny part. This is tumor we have left on the cochlear nerve in order to preserve hearing. And this piece, I operated this patient uh, more than five years ago and nothing has developed so far. So we are lucky. And uh, she had a good balance, uh, could use skin and so on. And finally, this large case, um, similar strategy, you see even in this large tumor, the first step is open the internal auditory canal using sitting position, again, uh, almost not using bipolar. And I, I show you similar. So even a bloody tumor, this is the advantage of the sitting position. In these cases, you have a, uh, even in bloody tumor, you have a, a not very bad view and we can dissect the, stru the structures away from uh, the tumor capsule. And I go, uh, to the end, so you can see at the end, using these debulkings and dissections, uh, we could perform a good removal and with preservation of the last uh, structures. And you see here the uh, accessory nerve and uh, facial nerve, even the vestibular, uh, the, the cochlear nerve was preserved anatomically 
but without without function. So, but if the cochlear nerve is preserved and uh, without function, you can try later on uh, a cochlear implant. Some patients want it, some others uh, do not want it. And even in large tumors like these for neurofibromatosis, mixture of meningiomas and schwannomas, we use the ratosigmoid approach to remove the tumor, and we use the ratosigmoid approach to put um, ABI. So we can make everything in using one single approach. Um, in some cases, we are lucky and we have House Brackman 1 immediately after surgery, like this case, despite complete removal, like this case, like this other case. But sometimes we have a, a worse, a worsening of the results like House Brackman 3 or House Brackman 4. The point is what happens with these cases. You see here, before surgery, almost all patients had House Brackman 1 and 2. Immediately after surgery, we had a deterioration in more than 50% of the cases. But what we observe is this improvement over time. So that in T1 tumors, all patients regained House Brackman 1 and 2. In T2 tumors, 99% had House Brackman 1 and 2. And T3 tumors, 93%. And in T4 tumors, uh, it was 77% uh, of the patients have House Brackman 1 and 2. Here are some examples, large tumors. All these patients developed House Brackman 4 immediately after surgery, but later on, they had very acceptable function so that I'm not too much afraid uh, to have House Brackman 4 after surgery. Of course, this is uh, absolutely not pleasant, but if we can achieve a radicality of tumor resection, and later on I have these phases, for me is very acceptable. There are of course cases like these, the patient had already facial palsy before surgery. We have, we left tumor behind, clear tumor behind to keep the remnant facial function here, House Brackman 3. Later on, she developed House Brackman 2 or all the patients, we can leave even more tumor behind. This tumor can be irradiated later on, but not that tumor. And what happens with the tumor remnant? This is the problem. If we have tumor remnant, in our series, we had 40% regrowth of this uh, subtotally removed tumor in comparison to 6% of totally removed tumor or gross total tumor removal and in T4, the same, the same situation. And these results are very comparable to the results published by Nakatomi 2017 in GNS. And finally, hearing preservation is a different, a difficult topic. We know that uh, in a number of cases, even with preservation of cochlear nerve, we can lose hearing. We have a couple of cases of, uh, of uh, hearing uh, recovery using a cochlear implant. We are still, and I guess everybody still fighting um, uh, to get better hearing preservation. These results are not that bad, but we hope we can improve them over time. So um, Michel has uh, shown his strategy. It looks uh, uh, very good for, for better hearing preservation. Although the question is what happens with tumor remnants if they will produce over time, uh, again, hearing loss or not, this is something that we have to wait for the follow-up. Complications in 1000 retrosigmoid approach, we had one, uh, one uh, mortality. The patient had uh, uh, thrombosis of the, of, the of the sigmoid sinus uh, with uh, uh, bleeding of the cerebellum and a lot of complications. Finally, he died six months later. Otherwise, uh, uh, six patients needed uh, resurgery because of bleeding within the CP angle, but they recovered. At the beginning of our series, we had 11% CSF leakage. Changing the technique, uh, we're using the endoscope and using bone wax and, and, and muscle with fibrin glue, we could reduce this rate to 3%. All of these patients being treated with uh, lumbar drain only, 
and very rarely we had to reoperate these cases. So this is in summary uh, what I, I wanna show to you and I hope we have a, a nice discussion uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcos, for sharing with us your impressive series and uh, result uh, on vestibular schwannoma surgery. So it's time now to, to move to the last speaker. Thank you for the first time also to Massimiliano Visocci to join us. Uh, Massimiliano will focus on another topic, which is the macrovascular decompression. So please, Massimiliano, up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, kind uh, involvement. And uh, it's a big honor to me to uh, share my experience on the uh, microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, do you see my slide? Yes. Thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, trigeminal neuralgia treatment by microvascular decompression starts from many years in our institution. And uh, our study have been supported both by Italian Society of Neurosurgery, but also uh, World Neurosurgeon Federation of Cranial Nerve Disorders, a very important, uh, huge, uh, worldwide uh, uh, society involved in uh, uh, cranial nerve uh, disorders, which was born in China many years ago. And uh, I had the opportunity to share also in, uh, in some publication what we have learned and also our mistakes. As uh, all we know, cranial uh, uh, neuralgia uh, is a, a complex uh, and uh, uh, quite difficult word to be understood, uh, including uh, trigeminal neuralgia, Riesberg neuralgia, vagal glossopharyngeal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, all different in the pathophysiology, but similar sometimes for clinical presentation. As all we know, uh, typical trigeminal neuralgia is uh, associated uh, with the uh, um, trigger point, uh, paroxysmal sensitivity to carbamazepine, absence of uh, hypoesthesia. On the other hand, uh, atypical. Uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia are more likely to be uh, related to infection, trauma, uh, this metabolic syndrome, uh, uh, vascular uh, uh, pathology, and uh, is a uh, cramping, burning, long lasting, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, allodinic uh, uh, neuralgia with the hypoanesthetic area and uh, constant topography generally is bilateral in. Uh, um, multiple sclerosis, especially young age. As we all know, uh, trigeminal uh, nucleus uh, is uh, uh, a, a three kind uh, of nucleus. The, the cranial, the more cranial one is a motor nucleus, mesencephalic one. The central one is a mainly uh, protopathic, epicritic uh, uh, sensitivity uh, nucleus uh, for uh, um, uh, proprioceptive uh, uh, perception and the dissenting uh, root of a trigeminal uh, nerve, uh, mesencephalic and high uh, cervical spinal cord is uh, much more consistent with the uh, pain transmission. Um, also, topography is very important to be known in order to orientate when we perform lesional or uh, conservative uh, uh, surgical maneuvers, since uh, uh, there is a rotation of uh, uh, V1, V2, V3, and uh, a, quite an inversion in the um, surgical view uh, of uh, uh, the uh, operator who's uh, uh, approaching uh, by an open manner uh, the trigeminal uh, root. Uh, the beautiful anatomic pictures that uh, uh, our previous colleagues showed us are uh, impressive in uh, showing how complex is uh, the, the word 
at the cerebellopontine angle uh, when we deal uh, both with the uh, um, trigeminal neuralgia and uh, uh, acoustic neurinoma or a conflict of the lower cranial nerve. Uh, many other outstanding speakers introduced the concept of a retrosigmoid approach. And uh, first of all, uh, according to the colleagues who presented the, the tractography and the neuroradiological pattern associated with the preoperative uh, planning in uh, uh, cerebellopontine surgery, uh, MRI examination is a uh, first choice, uh, mainly with the contrast medium, um, but also uh, CAT scan. Uh, are important in order to better detect uh, uh, calcification, uh, the uh, acoustic meatus, uh, and many other uh, uh, related anatomical landmarks in order to approach at the best the uh, trigeminal route. But let's start with the clinical position in our institution. We start uh, at the very beginning with uh, the Fukushima position, uh, the same for an um, extreme lateral approach to the cranial vertebral junction. And um, we um, found out that uh, this position can produce uh, some uh, um, problems in uh, um, venous uh, uh, flow. And uh, nevertheless, it's uh, very simple uh, to, be, uh, to be arranged in the operating theater. And also the um, uh, surgical approach and the wound, uh, the wound uh, uh, curvilinear incision are quite simple and uh, minimally invasive to be uh, considered for uh, uh, such a patient. The patient has to be uh, 15 degree uh, in a flexed uh, position with the head rotated 180 degree con on the contralateral side in order to expose and better offer to the surgical view the conflict. But uh, as uh, we all know, there are many other positions, the prone uh, position, the uh, concord position, uh, which is uh, a variation of the three-quarter prone position for the uh, cerebellar pontine angle, old-fashioned position, and also semi-sitting modified uh, um, uh, park bench uh, position are considered in our surgical armamentarium. Uh, as a matter of fact, park bank position is uh, right now the best preferred in our institution, and it allows uh, a best exposition of a cerebellopontine angle to general root origin to the surgical view, and also the um, air uh, inflation and also the venous uh, uh, circulation is uh, better allowed uh, by using also pillows under the axilla and uh, some anesthesiological uh, um, tip and tricks uh, to um, ensure a, a good uh, metabolism and uh, vascular uh, circulation. And as uh, we see here, uh, this is uh, the uh, surgical uh, opera, operating theater, and uh, also the uh, target point, the surgical uh, key point, uh, according to Tatajiba presentation, uh, who called uh, uh, a sterional approach, the pterional approach of posterior cranial force, a very interesting and clever definition of this simple but uh, delicate uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, approach. Uh, we can identify the angle uh, where to um, put the uh, drill between the um, uh, posterior root of a uh, zygomatic arc, which is an ideal prolongation of uh, uh, transverse uh, sinus and uh, the vertical line on the tip of the mastoid. In this angle, there is the um, asterion and uh, just close to it or on the asterion, we can perform the burr hole and then to enlarge with our 
uh, to thin and uh, perform a um, circular craniot craniotomy and not craniectomy as we were used to be to, to do in the past. Um, very important is uh, the um, uh, optic uh, assessment with the microscope, sometimes with uh, uh, the um, you know the man ma magnificating glasses uh, or endoscope. We will see at the end this presentation. But mainly, the uh, main actor of this uh, uh, complex uh, um, surgery and uh, assistance is uh, the neurophysiological uh, monitoring and assistance, which is performed in our institution, both by medical doctors and also a specialized technician. Uh, three topics are uh, the main uh, point of uh, this uh, uh, surgical uh, planning, positioning, and we have spoken about it, the possible CSF drainage, or just the um, intraoperative uh, CSF uh, sucking in order to better expose the angle and also uh, allow to the cerebellum to be flattened uh, according to the necessity of the surgeon. And the third topic is uh, what to do, craniectomy or craniotomy. As uh, I was introducing a few seconds ago, we prefer to perform a craniotomy, a circular craniotomy after plugging the, the emissary vein, which is uh, uh, um, external reference points of uh, the internal dural sinus. We perform a circular a quarter of, of dollars uh, uh, diameter uh, circular um, craniotomy. Uh, with uh, uh, our uh, uh, trephin, surgical trephin, uh, close and facing with the transverse and the sigmoid sinus. And we can open uh, with different manner, the dura like uh, Y shape or also uh, linear or semi-linear semi shape uh, manner in order to better tailor both uh, opening and closure of uh, the wound and avoid as much as possible post-operative CSF leakage according to the beautiful presentation of the speaker, the very beginning of this uh, um, beautiful webinar. We all know and are familiar with this uh, special anatomy with uh, the dandy vein, someone says to open it, to close, to cut it, 100% of the cases. I remember that uh, many uh, occasions Tata Jiba state that uh, he tried to preserve it as much as possible. Different way, different strategies. I oper operated at the very beginning of my career, many, many uh, cases uh, by cutting the dandy vein without any complication, but in one case among 100. But uh, right now I try to preserve it as much as possible uh, since, uh, since um, venous uh, circulation is strategic in this uh, complex and intricate local anatomy. And uh, as we can see, uh, we, we can uh, deal with the, the fourth nerve, the third nerve, or close to the five nerve, and uh, any vascular damage uh, close to this uh, intricate, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, wood uh, um, uh, anatomy can result in postoperative undesired uh, dysfunction, permanent or uh, uh, transient. Uh, but uh, let's see some uh, special case. This is a, a lady which was he, who underwent uh, to radio surgery for a, a typical, typical to geminal neuralgia uh, some years before a recurrence of a typical left side to geminal neuralgia, and uh, we uh, opened according to the uh, surgical principles which were. Um, exposed a few slides uh, ago, and uh, this is uh, what we have found in this case. 
as uh, you can see, very important is uh, to suspend the Dura, but also to withdraw the CSF and try by opening the uh, cisterns at the base of the cerebellum as well as uh, at uh, the uh, cerebellopontine angle to deflate and to manipulate as much as possible in a safe way and manner the um, uh, cerebellar hemisphere. But as you can see here, the arachnoid has a, a very gray appearance and uh, it shows the effect of uh, radio surgery. Uh, but uh, despite our expectations, uh, the CSF uh, drainage uh, as a consequence of arachnoid uh, opening is quite safe, sure, fast, without uh, many important uh, hemorrhage. And uh, we proceed uh, by uh, free debriding the uh, trigeminal root, which appears uh, without any um, uh, X-rays uh, related uh, wound uh, effect. Uh, we uh, just uh, f try to uh, decompress uh, by uh, arachnoid adherences uh, the root. I insist the root is uh, quite a um, normal one. Otherwise, uh, arachnoid surrounding the root is uh, very compromised. The uh, dandy vein is uh, uh, preserved. And uh, according to the, our strategies, uh, we uh, put around, around the root uh, a pillow of uh, inert material um, and uh, try to protect uh, uh, with the Teflon uh, from uh, the ICA uh, pulsation, the, the root. And then uh, we proceed uh, with the classic uh, traditional way uh, to uh, uh, fill and protect 360 degree the, uh, the root by preserving in our new uh, strategy the uh, dandy the dandy vein, and we 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 put uh, back uh, the mm, bone with uh, uh, some plates and skew titanium plates and skew. But which is the news? Is it really news? But uh, maybe a revival? The endoscope in cerebellopontine uh, uh, surgery. Uh, probably it is uh, the uh, boat because uh, at the beginning of the uh, seventies there were big, there was a, a big deal of interest of uh, on the use of endoscope to uh, system surgery and uh, complex cerebellopontine angle uh, surgery. But at uh, that time the technology was uh, not enough to ensure a complex uh, control three. Uh, 30 degree, 45 degree control of this local complex uh, anatomy. But the seed was uh, uh, put in the ground and in uh, some uh, uh, years, the attention and the expiration to uh, use, uh, to take advantage of uh, uh, endoscopy in this uh, cerebellopontine surgery rise up again and now um, endoscopy and microsurgery both are an important option in microvascular decompression for a, a typical typical trigeminal neuralgia and uh, as you can see here this is a typical uh, endoscopic uh, surgical theater with both the opportunity microscope and endoscope with the 4k um, visual opportunity and uh, this is uh, one of uh, our very first uh, use of endoscopy when we were used to perform a craniectomy uh, but uh, in uh, in this uh, theater you can see how useful is uh, uh, the endoscope to deep uh, in a, a very effective way in the local complex 
anatomy by preserving the dandy vein and also by um, peeling uh, the uh, trigeminal uh, uh, trigeminal root. And um, in this case, we performed a neurectomy uh, because of the special nature of the symptomatology. And uh, this is um, another uh, uh, surgical option. But uh, um, many uh, pictures, and I'm concluding right now, are available with the endoscopic tool, uh, different anatomy from the one we are used with uh, the classic uh, uh, microscope. And um, the endoscope uh, allows to control after the compression if uh, some uh, vascular um, uh, loops are still uh, uh, effective in compressing and uh, uh, offending. Uh, the nerve and allows us to better complete our uh, dissection and uh, uh, trigeminal root uh, presentation, as well as uh, uh, filling uh, the cistern with uh, inert material like uh, Teflon. And uh, mm, uh, endoscopy is uh, the future, in my opinion, of uh, uh, such a challenging surgery, but please don't forget that we have uh, to tailor our knowledge, our surgical tools, our knowledge to the specific uh, reality of our patient. So the patient first, and then what we prefer to use as a technical tool. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Massimiliano, for sharing with us so many tips and tricks to improve the results. I have not yet had the chance to present. Can you stop to share your screen, Massimiliano? Yes, I'm trying. Just <laughs> a second. To present the Casper Eckard, who would join us uh, in the panelist uh, to enter the discussion. I think, uh, Eck, that we have had a wonderful webinar in order to improve how to manage such difficult lesions. Uh, we can decrease the morbidity from the preoperative planning to the closure, and we have had the chance to see wonderful results for vestibular schwannoma surgery, all the tips and tricks that were shared with us, also for microvascular decompression in order to improve the results. There are plenty of questions. Maybe, Ek, if you have uh, one special comment after all those wonderful talks, there are these questions that were answered in the chat box, but maybe, Eckhart, would you like to make a comment and uh, give also your input into the discussion, please? You are just muted. For having me, I just wanted to yes. congratulate the last speaker. Um, I think uh, Massimiliano, Exquisitely said at the end, you know, it's all about the patient in front of us, and we need to optimize the approach as well as the tools that we use to get the best. And I think uh, if we can take this away from today's seminar, that's uh, for me already a very important teaching point. You want to optimize every aspect of your surgery and every step on the way based on the local anatomy that you find in the one patient in front of you. So pre-surgical imaging for me is one of the most important aspects of planning the right surgery to get the positioning right, to get your, your thoughts right, how you would like to approach a large vestibular schwannoma, how to avoid complications. I think it's all, you know, the mindset from the very beginning of the case. And then using endoscopy as an additional tool to be able to inspect your uh, resection cavity locally to understand is there maybe something I didn't see well through the microscope um, as, uh, as was said is uh, excellent as a, a teaching point for today's seminar. I really just want to start with that. Thank you, Eric. Is there any question of uh, one of you? Uh, th there was a question of, uh, the, from the audience about uh, the possibility of vascular complication in uh, cerebral pontine angle in the surgery. And uh, I think that uh, 
uh, we, we should focalize uh, our attention to the um, possibility of uh, sigmoid sinus thrombosis mm -hmm. in uh, cerebral pontine angle because we didn't speak about in this wonderful seminar, but it is uh, an um, understood and quite mysterious um, uh, 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 complication of our surgery. Why? We uh, face sometimes one uh, one one percent of uh, our cases. Uh, why we face with this uh, complication? And according to the hematologist, uh, uh, all the um, anticoagulant uh, therapy is not indicated because uh, uh, this uh, thrombosis uh, they state is uh, transient and. Uh, um, uh, quite safe one. But uh, when we retrospectively examine our surgery, also by video, we do not find any strange movement or compression to the transverse sinus to justify such uh, a finding. So to me, it remains a mystery. Mister. What is your explanation, interpretation of this unusual but possible complication? Yes, indeed, it's uh, something that can happen. And I hypothesize at some point that it is the eating source of the microscope that could induce some kind of thrombosis. And so protecting with uh, cotton pads, uh, water, and also maybe the retraction of the dura Tracting a little on the on the sinus, maybe Marcos or the other if uh, other explanations about that. I I think the the easiest explanation is uh, any kind of uh, injury to the sinus. So, <laughs> not the microscope. We should not put the 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 cause to the microscope. I, I must say I'm, I'm not present in all craniotomy procedures because this is done by the residents. And um, uh, you may have uh, uh, injury of coagulation of the emissary vein. So you, you find the emissary vein in almost all cases. And uh, um, how to deal with emissary vein is very important. And another point is if there is any bleeding of the sinus, uh, the resident should never put gel form in that area because it's highly thrombogenic, highly thrombogenic. So if there is any injury to the wall of the sinus, what I do is I put a piece of muscle, not inside, but covering. I create a new wall with muscle and fibrin glue surrounding that. And then after surgery, we do a CT phlebrography in order to see uh, how the sinus is doing. And if the patient has no bleeding within the head, we start early with low dose heparin. Because you know, a bleeding you can remove. Thrombosis of the sinus, you, you are lost. I, I lost one patient because of thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus. It was, it was the only case we lost in this series. It was uh, a dominant sinus and no chance, we had cerebellar edema, bleeding, and everything was congested. So um, in my opinion, it's a very, very important topic. And uh, when we had uh, uh, a webinar on complications in neurosurgery mm -hmm. uh, organized by Keke Turel, this point has been pretty much discussed. But this is a point we could discuss in another webinar from the EINS. <laughs> For sure, it is planet on the complications. But it's, uh, it's sometimes impressive to see under the microscope uh, what is the heat. If the yeah. light is uh, very high, the heat under the light is very impressive. So I will also be careful at that point. Yes. I, I agree with both of you. I think that the sum of many factors, uh, each one uh, uh, insufficient to, to drive by itself this complication, but all of this, all of them uh, together, probably enough to uh, produce and promote thrombosis must be claimed. I think that also dura suspension with the uh, switches and some weight 
uh, we use uh, Clamer, Cocker, you know, and they, if you, if you try to evaluate how is uh, heavy this uh, piece of metal on a very small um, tri triangular, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, flap close uh, to the, uh, the dura sinus, probably we can understand how functional hypo perfusion can produce and uh, how functional uh, venous st stenosis can produce. And so I don't know many complex factors, but uh, a true reality to be better investigated. Yeah. And the use of bipolar on the wall. You saw sometimes you have some bleeding and put bipolar on the wall. In my opinion, this is even more dangerous than the heating of a microscope. We are already late. There are also one question about the lumbar drainage. Uh, if you can uh, give your opinion on the place of lumbar drainage in huge tumor, I have my answer, but I would like to hear yours. <laughs> I never use it. <laughs> I use then, only if there is CSF leakage. At the very beginning of our surgical activity, we were used to put 100% lumbar drainage uh, before uh, opening and as soon as we opened the dura the lumbar drainage was uh, activated but uh, uh, right now starting from many years uh, we uh, stopped to put the drainage and we uh, for, we orientated our surgery to find as soon as possible the ambient cisterna uh, and to open it and to suck and drain CSF from the very beginning at the base of the cerebellum and then at the, the cerebellopontine angle and so to uh, make more mobile and uh, uh, smooth uh, the surgical manipulation. I think unless uh, there is another comment, we all agree on that. So I would like to congratulate you for all your wonderful talks. I think we had a very great webinar. Uh, it's time now to, to leave you and uh, we will have the opportunity to be again uh, together in one month on another topic. It was a, a pleasure for me and uh, I would like my, to, say, to send you my best wishes for uh, the end of the year and uh, the coming new year. So it was the last time this year that we are together and uh, it will be my pleasure to, to meet you at the beginning of uh, January for our next uh, future project. Okay. Merry Thank Christmas. You. Happy New Year. Bye-bye to you. all of you and mm -hmm. uh, see you next time. Bye-bye, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye.